matters. Uh, we will have the two talks uh, in a row, and then after that, there will be uh, an opportunity to ask questions and to, to make comments. And we start with uh, Dr. Declan Downey, uh, uh, what, and all members of the panel here, I'm very pleased to say, have been here at UL before, many times before some of them in the history of the Centre for Irish German Studies, and we are so very, very pleased to have them here as well. Dr. Downey is a lecturer in modern European and Japanese diplomatic history in the School of History at uh, UCD. I find it very impressive and also very, um, very, very important to mention that uh, Dr. Downey works across eight languages among which a, a beautiful, very fluent uh, Dutch, I'm uh, very pleased to say. <laughs> uh, he uh, has done tremendous work on Spanish-Irish uh, relations, uh, the Habsburg on the Japanese relations to, uh, to Ireland and all history going through that. But he's also very much a specialist on Austrian-Irish relations, and that is what he will speak about today. Declan, I think you might want to come down here so that also the audience online has the pleasure of seeing you uh, seeing you give your paper here. Thank you very much. Thank you. The floor is all you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marika, for your very kind words of introduction. And I should also like to thank Gisela and Natasha for your wonderful work in organizing this event and for inviting me to speak today. And I must say I'm deeply impressed by the range of papers you've organized, the speakers. It's great to see some dear friends uh, uh, speaking here earlier. And uh, also I'm deeply impressed by your wonderful hospitality and your kindness and consideration in organizing every little detail for us. So thank you so much. So I'm going to give you a, um, an overview, uh, tour d'horizon, of the Irish engagement with Austria from earliest recorded times. So the earliest rec records that we have date all the way back to the middle of the 12th century, uh, long before the Norman arrival in Ireland, uh, the Irish Benedictine monks at Regensburg in the Abbey of St. James or the Jakob Stift, they were invited by Heinrich III, Jasomir Gott Wabenberg, to come to Vienna and to establish the Schotten, as we know it today. There's a wonderful 18th century painting there of the Schotten and a photograph. Again, there on the Freyung, you can see very little has changed. Uh, maybe they've better traffic control, but uh, there you are. 1365, the Abbey was involved with the foundation of the University of Vienna. And right through the centuries, the Abbey buildings have provided uh, wonderful facilities for the university. And of course, the part of the law faculty is uh, based there as well. So it's... Uh, a place that uh, is deeply connecting the tradition of Irish scholarship and learning and bringing that back into Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire. And with the new Renaissance uh, in the Carolingian and Ottonian periods of learning in Europe at that time. And the Abbey, like the other Schotten, right across the German speaking world at that time, was very much involved as a center for learning, a center for the dissemination of culture, etc. And as you can see, right from the very foundation of the University of Vienna, there has an Irish connection. Uh, Abbot Donaldus of the Abbey from between 1380 and 1392 was actually the rector of the University of Vienna as well. And uh, we are very grateful to Dagmar Nierian Radl, who has done superb research work on the history of the Schottenstifte and of early Irish monastic and scholarly engagement in Europe during this period. And she has identified indeed quite a few connections between the Abbey 
at Vienna and this part of Munster, here in North Munster. Uh, it is thought that Donaldus may have originated in the Diocese of Killaloo, which is not too far away, and uh, that he had uh, uh, gone to Cashel and from there on to Regensburg and subsequently to Vienna. The adoption of the reforms in Melk uh, in the Abbey in 1418, just at the beginning of the 15th century, marks the end of what was called the Irish era in the Abbey itself. So uh, from then on, it's, uh, it is exclusively German speaking. Uh, and also, as in the, the community is exclusively German speaking, uh, there are very few Irish monks coming out at this stage to the continent, or at least to Vienna at this point. And the, um, then, of course, as I say, it's, it, it becomes very much part of Austrian society and life exclusively. Um, it, it, it's, it's connections with Ireland during that period from 1418 onwards up until the middle of the 17th century, the relationship sort of goes into a dormancy. But then things begin to revive by the middle of the late 17th century again, and I'll come back to that shortly. But also just to point out that in 1807, you have the foundation of the Shorten Gymnasium, a wonderful secondary school in the Abbey itself. And uh, I think uh, it's worth noting here that quite a few of our ambassadors from Austria had been uh, students at the Schotten Gymnasium, so uh, that keeps that connection going too. Here we have the first figure of importance from Ireland in the middle of the 17th century who comes to Vienna, and this is Oliver Walsh of Carrick Mines, Dublin. Now, during the period of the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 until 1648. You have the various Habsburg armies, as you are aware, Wallenstein and Tilly were very much involved in uh, directing the imperial troops, along with Sp Spinola directing the Spanish troops in the engagement with the, the German uh, Protestant princes and their armies, and then, of course, the Swedes and the Danes and the French. So it becomes an internationalized conflict right across Germany. Germania Desolata sums it up. Uh, it was one of the most horrific periods in the history of that region of central, right across North Central Europe. So in this period of conflict, many Irish regiments were raised for service with Habsburg Spain, the oldest Irish military unit dates back to 1605, and it wasn't founded for British service, it was founded for Spanish service. Uh, the regiment of O'Neill, or Tercio of O'Neill, later to become the Tercio of Hibernia. So that would give over 200 years of service to the Spanish monarchy. But some of these Irishmen who were with Spinola in Flanders and crossing with him into northern Germany uh, also transferred from the Spanish service into the Habsburg service. And they were seconded, as it were, to the army of Wallenstein and others to the army of Tilly, the two great generals. And of course, Oliver Wallis was, uh, as I said, he was one of the first of these characters to bring his cavalry regiment into the Habsburg service of Austria. He is one who gains considerable influence as not just only a military strategist, but also as a political advisor to the king of the Romans, the heir to Emperor uh, Ferdinand II, the future Emperor Ferdinand III, the emperor who would reconcile all the German princes, Catholic and Protestant alike, into a new emergence of a consciousness of Germanitas in the empire, which comes very much to the fore in 1635 at the Peace of Prague. 
Walsh of Valis, as he became known, was one of the architects of that piece, bringing together the separate groups and getting them to think not in terms of being Catholic or Calvinist or Lutheran, but instead to think of being German. And you have the earliest expressions of the Reichspatriotismus or imperial patriotism, but also a sense of what it is to be German. And this comes through in the literature of that period from 1635 onwards. And Walsh, as said, he becomes an imperial chamberlain, very close proximity to the Emperor Ferdinand III. And his family become the first Irish family to be absolutely entrenched in the Austrian and Bohemian noble establishments. People will say, yes, what about Taffer? Taffer, Lucas Taffer comes through and Theobald Taffer a little bit later than the Walchers, and they didn't come into the direct service of the Habsburgs. They came in directly as representatives of Charles I. The Tafs were the ambassadors of Charles I to the imperial court, but with the Cromwellian campaign in Ireland from 1649 to 1653, the Tafs remained safely in Vienna and, of course, went on to become again very much entrenched into the Austro-Hungarian uh, and Bohemian nobilities and would flourish even just as well as the Walshes of Carrick Mines. I should also mention here that with Walsh of Carrick Mines came someone also from this locality, from Ross Gray, Walter Butler. And he was persuaded by Walsh to come over to the Austrian colors from the Spanish colors. Now, Walter's brother, Richard Butler, interestingly enough, had been recruited by Wentworth to serve with the Swedish army. And after the Battle of Nordlingen, the, uh, that Richard Butler's uh, uh, regiment crossed to the Habsburg colors as well. Now, you must remember that Walter Butler, along with a Scotsman, Walter Leslie, and another Walter, uh, Walter Devereux from Waterford, were the three Walters who were involved in the assassination of Wallenstein, a judicious murder that satisfied the Emperor Ferdinand II and had uh, led to their ennoblement and aggrandizement as well. The Butlers inherited quite a few of the Wallenstein estates indeed in Bohemia, and they also inherited estates in Bavaria. And they continue in Bavaria to this day, the family of von Butler. And then there's another person I should mention here before moving on, another interesting figure from Ireland in the middle of the 17th century, and that is Thomas Carve or Carew. He was the protonotary apostolic in Vienna. He was a priest from Tipperary. His Carve Tipperariensis is how he signs himself, etc. And that's so we know he's from Tipperary. What part we're not quite sure about, but he's from Tipperary. And he is the one who left us the earliest historical accounts of the origins of the Thirty Years' War. It's a major uh, text. And uh, also the whole, um, he, his itinerarium, uh, he, he describes his travels right around Germany during this time, and it is a most important book. So um, another figure I might also mention in that regard is Henry Fitzsimons, the Dublin Jesuit, uh, who also wrote of his, um, the Punya Pragensis. Uh, it was a, a, an account of the Thirty Years' War in Bohemia and the Battle of the White Mountain. So two of the earliest eyewitness accounts that were published, the first eyewitness accounts that were published, major bestsellers in Europe, were by these two Irishmen. So, just to give you a sense of the wider context at this time, 
you have a list there of some notable Irish regiments and companies in the Continental Armies. Spain was held the, the most of them. It is the oldest military establishment in which there were Irish units in service. Tercios of O'Neill, O'Donnell, Fitzgerald, Preston, Owen Roneil, O'Donnelly. And later in the 18th century, they become reformed into the regiments of Hibernia, Ultonia, Limerick and Clonard. In France, during this period, towards the end of the 17th century, from 1690 onwards, you have the formation of Irish regiments in the French service, the Irish Brigade, uh, with the regiments of Clare, Berwick, Galmoy, Sheldon, Dillon and Lally Tollendal. But Austria is there after Spain because in the, in the late, uh, well, the middle of the uh, 17th century, from the 1630s onwards, you have the formation of regiments of Butler, Brown, Devereux, O'Donnell and Walsh. And in Bavaria, you have the regiment also of Butler and Hüning O'Carroll uh, from the Midlands up there, County Offaly. So there's uh, quite a number of them come from the River Shannon and they seem to be recruited through the Shannon. We can talk about that if you want any questions. So also in terms of the first generation of Irish statesmen in Europe during this time, because Irish historiography tends to focus too much on what was happening in Ireland itself, the Confederation of Kilkenny, the Cromwellian Wars, and it's all quite miserable. And it even gets worse when we get to the 19th century, but that's another matter. But I'd like to focus your minds on this first generation of Irish statesmen in Europe during the 17th century. From the mid to the late 17th century, you have, for instance, Fray Domingo de Rosario O'Daly, who was the ambassador extraordinary and effective foreign minister and president of the Privy Council of King John IV of Portugal. And he flourished between 1640 and 1662. He came from Kilsarkin near Castle Island in County Kerry. Uh, a remarkable figure, and this year we celebrated the 360th anniversary of his death. We had a marvellous uh, occasion in Lisbon uh, uh, to, to commemorate that. Uh, he is, um, again, a very important figure. Uh, he ministered here in the Limerick and North Tipperary area briefly in the 1620s uh, before going back to the continent, and he was involved in active recruitment as well of young men from this region to serve in the armies of Habsburg Spain. And later he attracted a cavalry regiment to come into the service of Portugal after uh, 1640, around 16, about 1647. Oliver, oh yes, Francis Taff, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, he's the son of um, Theobald Taff. He had been educated at Olmutz and uh, became a court page of uh, Ferdinand II and later Ferdinand III and rose to become Chancellor or Prime Minister of the Duchy of Lorraine during the reign of Emperor Charles VI. Again, a very important figure in terms of drawing more people from Ireland into the Habsburg service at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th centuries. A uh, very interesting figure and establishes the Taft dynasty effectively in the Austrian service. Oliver Walsh of Carrick Mines, whom I'd mentioned earlier, and then, of course, Dermizio O'Sullivan Bear, whose portrait you see there as well, along with O'Daly's on the screen. Uh, the full length portrait by Pantoja de la Cruz, who was the court painter of Philip III, and uh, he was a very important figure as a councillor of state and war for Kings Philip III and Philip IV of Spain. John Andrew Hamilton is another Irish figure from County Leitrim and also had relatives in North Tipperary. He was president of the Imperial War Council under Emperors Leopold I and Charles VI. He is the first Irishman to get that position. And we come back to that. And of course, his Brother Julius Francis Xavier Hamilton was a member of the Imperial Aulic Council 
and president of the Imperial Court of Justice under the Emperor Charles VI. So this is to give you a sense of context here. It's not just only in Habsburg, Austria, but also in Spain and in Portugal at this time, you have these figures from Ireland emerging to very senior positions in government. Emperor Leopold I, of course, saw a massive influx of Irish people during the 1690s into his realms. And having already had this small group of the Tafts and the Walchers and the Butlers at the Imperial Court already, there's already a whole connection and network has been set up. So we go into the late 17th, early 18th centuries now under the reigns of Leopold I and Charles VI. So Francis Paul Walsh, the grandson of Oliver, whom I'd mentioned earlier, uh, he married strategically Cecilia Liechtenstein and uh, had served in the army and also then went into the administration and served as a diplomat, uh, particularly at the Saxon and the Prussian courts. So Francis Paul Walsh was elevated from a baronage to the title of imperial count. Now, look at the Germanicization of their titles. This is a theme I will come back to. Valis von Karigmain the Germanization of the spellings of their places of origin in Ireland. And this is something you will see as we go further in this presentation. And I'll come back to that. The importance for these emigres over generations of their place of origin in Ireland being preserved in their title. A sense of retaining something of their own identity while integrating and assimilating into the identity of their host society, in this case, Austria. Johann Andreas Hamilton, as I mentioned, president of the Imperial Council of War, Julius Franz Xavier, member of the Imperial Aulic Council, which is the highest court in the, rel in the empire and president of the Imperial Court of Justice. Another Oliver Wenzel, Walsh, or also created uh, Graf Wallis von Karigmain, a serious uh, field commander in the late 17th century in the wars against the Turks under Charles VI. And then General George Brown, Reichsgraf Brown, de Camus und Monte Ani. Noch Ani, ladies and gentlemen, not far from here. We can actually see the peak of it. And there is Ornia, queen of the monster fairies, smiling upon us all. So George Brown, he is an important figure for Austrian military history because he is the one who writes a very important um, document or manual on military formation, training, maneuvers, strategies. And it's called the Kriegs Exercitum. And it will be published and made in full use for the Austrian military establishment later in the 18th century by one of his cousins who becomes the Imperial uh, War or president of the Imperial War Council, the Kriegshofrat. And that is Francis Morris de Lacy of Brewery. There's a very strong limerick element you will see coming through here now as we go forward, particularly between the Browns and the De Lacy's and the Herberts, other families from this region. And then, of course, we have the Reichsgraf William O'Kelly von Akrim from East Galway. He had gone to Vienna to study philosophy and law and became ultimately the provost of the Noble Academy of Vienna. He became the Imperial Poet Laureate because he was the one who did a lot of work to revive the popularity of Horatian poetry, the Horatian Ode, into the 18th century, making it popular again. And he was appointed King of Arms and Grand Herald of the Holy Roman Empire. This is a very important role 
to, for him to fulfill, because as now you see after the collapse of the Irish Jacobite forces in Limerick in 1691, and in October of that year, Patrick Sarsfield was leaving and vowed to return like the wild geese, hence the term the wild geese. So you have many Irish people going now to the continent. Many of them go to France principally. Others go traditionally to Spain, the other great receiver. But now you have a whole new group coming in large numbers into Austria itself and into the German world and bringing with them documents to prove their identities, their lineages, etc. And in this regard, having an Irishman as the imperial grand herald to help considerably with the verification of their identities and their genealogies and their noble lineages and coats of arms, rights to bear arms is very important. They knew how to operate strategically, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the great figures who gave them immense patronage during this time was the great Prince Eugene of Savoy. And among his Irish protégés were Franz Wenzel Walsh, Valis of Carrickmine, the first Irishman to become a Knight of the Golden Fleece, General Nicholas Tafe, 5th Earl of Carlingford, also receive, he would receive the Golden Fleece, and Field Marshal Maximilian Ulysses von Braun, a nephew of George Braun, whom I had mentioned earlier, and also a Knight of the Golden Fleece. You see how social ascent is very rapid for this group. Not only through intermarriage with families like the Kinskys and the Lindenaus and the Liechtensteins and Schwarzenbergs, but also through their merits in service. They become the Dienstadel or the service nobility of the Habsburgs and identify very closely with them. And in this regard, I'd like to draw your attention to another connection between Eugene of Savoy and the McNaney family. Patrick McNaney had originally gone to Leuven to study for the priesthood. He had developed a great penchant for the study of law, and um, he decided to remain as a lay person and not seek ordination and pursued a very successful career as the Lance Advocat in Brabant. Uh, later ascended into the Habsburg, um, the Spanish Habsburg um, administration of the Habsburg Netherlands in Brussels, and he became Secretary of State, Prime Minister of Habsburg Flanders. And he was the one who oversaw the transition from the Spanish to the Austrian Habsburg control of that region. Because after 1715, with the Peace of Utrecht, Spain had to cede Flanders to Austria as part of the settlement. So McNaney was the one who handled the political transition of the Netherlands, the Habsburg Netherlands in this case, from Spanish to Austrian control. He was also the liaison between. Prince Eugene of Savoy and John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, and was very important in ensuring that the troops of both of these field marshals were well supplied in their campaigns against Louis XIV. McNaney's sons would succeed him. Uh, one, uh, Patrick McNaney would become the private secretary to the Empress Maria Theresa. He went with Eugene of Savoy as one of his pages back to Vienna, where he was uh, pursued his further education. And his other son, uh, Francis, would become the Minister of Finances for the Habsburg Netherlands. I have mentioned William O'Kelly of Ockram and John Andreas Hamilton, but this is the group that side very closely with Eugene of Savoy in terms of the court politics in Vienna. So this is just to give you an insight into networking. 
But when we look at a wider European context, the second generation of Irish statesmen, or statesmen, I should say, in Europe of Irish origin during the 18th century, there you have, number one, the great portrait itself, another man with Limerick origins, Ricardo Wall y Devereux. His father was from Kilmallock, his mother was from Waterford, and he was the first of Irish origin to become Prime Minister of Spain under Kings Ferdinand VI and Charles III. And he ruled in Spain from 1754 to 1763. And I was instrumental in helping the National Gallery of Ireland to obtain this portrait of um, Wall. It's a magnificent one by Michel von Loh, who was the court painter of the Habsburg dynasty. Thank you. So again, you look there at the list of names that ring out to you. McEnany, the foreign minister, secretary of state in Flanders. James Fitzjames Stuart, ambassador extraordinary of King Philip V of Spain. Ricardo Wall, first Irish prime minister of Spain. John Thomas O'Donoghue, president of the Court of Justice and Notary General of Brabant in the Austrian Flanders. William O'Kelly of Ockram, as I mentioned earlier. Field Marshal Francis Morris de Lacy, president of the Imperial War Council, and of course the Hogan brothers from North Tipperary, who were very much involved in the reforms of Pombal in 18th century Portugal. Now we come back into the 18th century Vienna with that great monument to the Empress Maria Theresa, surrounded by her great ministers and her generals. And again, Maximilian Ulysses von Braun, the one who had the distinction of stopping Frederick the Great of Prussia in his tracks at the Siege of Prague in 1757. O'Kelly of Ockram, a nephew of the poet laureate. Another great figure was G General Henry O'Donnell of Tyrconnell, and he was the first uh, Irishman to become invested in the Maria Theresian order. And of course, Field Marshal Francis Morris de Lacy, Reichsgraf von Bruff und Brury. It's wonderful, isn't it? And President of the Imperial Council of War, Knight of the Golden Feast, confident of the Emperor Joseph II and mentor of Charles Joseph, Prince de Ligne, Le Charmeur de l'Europe. And of course, there's Down, who was also president of the Imperial War Council and a great uh, figure for the Irish in Vienna. Maximilian Ulysses von Braun and his family, George von Braun. These are just some of the North Munster families there. Uh, the Browns, the Laces of Balangari and the Herberts of Rathkeel. And there's de Lacy himself, a uh, wonderful portrait of him. And there's another view of de Lacy on horseback. And uh, there are two others there, John Sigismund Count Maguire. He was uh, um, from um, Ballymacalligot in County Kerry. The family originated from Enniskillen, but they had been uh, given lands there by Charles II in compensation for what they had lost under Cromwell. But when you look at this culturation and identity preservation, just look at the names. And again, you see the great classical tradition of education coming through in these people, Latin and French and Spanish and German were taught to them before they went to the continent. And you see that in their names and you see it in their testimonials. We actually know who taught them. And we can talk about that at question time if you like. I'm conscious of time. But just look at the names like Peter Julius Caesar McElligot or General Anthony Charles or Anton Karl McElligot or Thaddeus O'Hussey von Dengen i Kush, Dangen i Kush, ladies and gentlemen. I hope Eamon O'Queeve is listening in. Now, I put him in there at the Siege of Vienna, 1683, because he is the one who, along with Herr Heiner, the baker, uh, discovered the Turkish sappers undermining the city walls and coming into the city. So they gave the signal to Starenberg, uh, and he sent the flares up from the Steffensdom. And of course, you had uh, you, um, Eugene of Savoy, who was a young man at that stage, and, and uh, Jan Sobieski and the others 
all up there on the Kahlenberg Heights and came in the great swoop that drove the Turks from the gates of Vienna. And of course, uh, uh, Heiner got the imperial patent to create the croissant in celebration. It's not a French invention, ladies and gentlemen, it's Austrian. And I like this John Fitzmaurice von Lichnau and James O'Daly von Kasselmein. So again, you see acculturation and identification of places in Ireland in their titles. Maximilian Hamilton, Prince Bishop of Olmutz, and of course Laval Graf Nugent von Ballina Karau, a great figure, not just only in the annals of Austrian military history, but also after his military career, he was a, a member of the Hungarian parliament representing Croatia. And he was a staunch defender of Croatian um, rights, their culture, their language, etc., in the Hungarian parliament, because the Magyars were trying to enforce a uniformity of Hungarian on the crown lands attached to the Hungarian crown. But this gentleman is still celebrated in Croatia today as something of a local hero, and he stood up for their rights in the Hungarian parliament. Maximilian Graf O'Donnell von Lachfeld, Kasselba und Tirconnell, the man who saved the life of Kaiser Franz Josef from the assassin's attempt on him uh, in 1851. And there is the great Edward Reichsgraf Taft von Carlingford und Ballymot, the longest serving prime minister under Kaiser Franz Josef, an instigator of social and economic reforms in Austria, the man who also handled sensitively the Meierling affair. So, um, and again, just to give you a sense of the time, his contemporaries, Leopold O'Donnell, Duke of Tetuan, and second Spanish prime minister of Irish origin, contemporary of his at that time, and also another contemporary, Edmund Patrice McMahon, who came from Dura Doyle, or his grandfather came from Dura Doyle, I should say, but uh, it was McMahon de Dura Doyle <laughs> in French, and he's the Duke of Magenta, and of course, Marshal of France, and first president of the Third Republic. And what does Irish 19th century historiography do? It focuses on Fenians, famines, and failures. Instead of looking to the continent at these great statesmen of the age, France, Austria, Hungary, etc. So, and of course, there's this wonderful portrait of uh, Heinrich Reichsgraf Taff, the son of Edward, and uh, this is by the Austrian imperial court painter Victor Schaff. And what I'm getting at here, ladies and gentlemen, just in by way of summing up, I'm trying to portray to you just how close these figures were to the dynasty itself, advising the emperor, very closely linked, aide de camp or an advisor or prime minister, whatever. Alfred Freiherr von Barry of the Kriegsmarine, he was the one who brought the emperor's brother Maximilian to Mexico when he became emperor there. And of course, subsequently was dispatched to bring his body back. And there's the Kaiser Franz Josef, Karl Freiherr von Brady, You've probably heard of the Kunil Bradis. They had a wonderful uh, pharmacy, etc., uh, in 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 Vienna. Uh, but this is the family, and of course they uh, they had uh, uh, dominated in the Austrian Imperial Navy itself in Trieste. And there's Graf Wallis von Karikmain, George, with the young Otto von Habsburg. He was only six years of age at the time at the coronation of his father, Charles, as King of Hungary, and has left us an interesting account there of that too. Again, you see right from the 17th century up to the beginning of the 20th century, the Walches of Carrick Mines are very close to the imperial family. And there, finally, the most decorated heiress of World War I to survive, Gottfried von Bamfield, the architect of naval air support in World War I. And Karl von Blas's wonderful painting of the first promotion of the Maria Theresian order on the 7th of March, 1758. And there you see um, he's placing the collar on O'Donnell and behind him is Maguire who's ascending the steps. And then you have the last promotion of the order at the Villa Vartholz on the 17th of August, 1917. And we can blame the Americans for what happened after that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, please.
seconds. Thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. I could listen to you for hours and hours and hours. There's such a treasure trove of amazing and wonderful stories um, there. But we have to move on. And one of the things I forgot to mention earlier, and which is very important, is that apart from all his other accolades, Declan is also the um, president, of course, of the Irish uh, Austrian Society. And I know that there are a couple of uh, uh, members there uh, online as well. And that leads me over very nicely to the former uh, president of the Irish Austrian Society. Uh, Paul Dobsky, if you come over to uh, continue here and uh, our, our fabulous and also, I might add, also Austrian uh, Natasha Boogie, who is doing once again fantastic work here. Moving over. Oh. Paul Dobsky, as I said, uh, <coughs> former president of the Aus Irish Austrian Society. Uh, also chairman of the Wexford Walking Trails. I was del made, delighted, delighted to see, and uh, with a very close connection to the venerable and, and beautiful Klongolfs Boot College. Also, he will speak to us on the history of the Irish Austrian Society. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I am most indebted to Dr. Downey uh, for uh, his presentation. I do it's going to be difficult to follow, but I'll give it a bash. Um, and I was wondering, is there any relationship between the penal laws and the Nuremberg laws? In, uh, um, maybe Dr. Downey could explain details later to you if you're interested. Uh, but to step onto his ground for a very short moment, I'd like to tell you about a great party held in Vienna on St. Patrick's Day in 1766, during Lent, hence a very popular party. The Spanish ambassador, Count Dermico O'Mahony, had among his guests the ambassador from the court of St. James, who reported back to London on the party. The most telling uh, was that he mentioned the high rank of some of the guests. And uh, my reading of his report back to London was penal laws in Ireland and look where the Irish are now. In that the Nuremberg laws produced a vast brain drain in mainland Europe and Ireland benefited in no small way, as you may gather from what I'm about to tell you. So. The roots of the Irish Austrian society are in the old Vienna club founded in Dublin during the emergency by the Hirsch family. And uh, here you see uh, a one pager explaining what the Vienna, uh, the old Vienna club was about. And uh, it basically was uh, a place for uh, people uh, who had been forced to leave their, their homes, their families, their friends. But it served its purpose and life moved on after the war. Many Austrians continued to live and to prosper in Ireland. In 1955, Austria waved goodbye to the Soviets and Allied powers. And five years later, the Irish Austrian Society was formed in Dublin. It was in many ways modelled on the Anglo-Austrian society and enjoyed close relationship with the London-based society. In those days, there were no direct flights to Austria. Founding members in particular in Britain were of Jewish extract, but I have the impression that in Ireland, both indigenous Irish and Central Europeans made up the original membership. With the Austro-Hungarian Empire gone, and the Soviet Warsaw Pact in place at that time, sure, where else would you go to feel at home occasionally? Even Germans who wanted to enjoy our crack became members. True to our founding ambitions, uh, we had regular cultural events. So I should pass on to give you the slides here. Uh, it was a very formal process to set up the Irish Austrian Society. Um, 
You're all far too young to remember the old Jury's Hotel just off College Green, perhaps one exception. Uh, so that's where they met for the first time. And they're the handwritten notes. I recognize the handwriting from the 20th of September 1960. And these are the gentle men and women who joined the initial committee. And I think this last chap, Mr. F. Rooney, uh, defected shortly afterwards uh, and founded the Ski Club of Ireland. <laughs> uh, so the newly elected committee held its first meeting in 121 St. Stephen's Green, which was my father's office, uh, which had two magnificent brass plates polished with the Austrian eagle as he represented in an honorary capacity, uh, both Austrian trade and Austrian tourist interests. Um, so this is quite interesting how um, we didn't have an ambassador in Dublin in, in those days, and it was the ambassador in Paris who was also accredited to Ireland. And he was invited to act as the honorary president. And we had a, a, an honorary consul, uh, Mr. Scheel. I never actually remember meeting him. And then uh, we had as a vice president, uh, Noel Peart, if that name rings any bells, senior counsel and uh, very much an Austrophile. And uh, he was, um, I think he was head of the Knights of Malta. So that's how we used to get the use of that fine hall on Clyde Road. Um, yeah, 10 and sixpence, that'd be what? It'd buy you about five pints, I reckon, in today's money. Uh, you see, they notified Dublin Castle and uh, the Department of External Affairs, which went on to become Department of Foreign Affairs. So uh, I had never met Dr. Zanetti. Don't know if it means anything to uh, the ambassador, but uh, he, he attended the uh, first meeting and uh, confirmed that uh, the ambassador, who had he been in Dublin, the, uh, certainly the Evening Herald would have called him Herr Rotter. Um, so these were the aims of the society when it started up uh, to foster cultural relations, non-political, non-sectarian, and to promote the knowledge of the language, literature, art, music, folk dancing, which frankly didn't really take off. <laughs> and to promote a knowledge of Ireland and Austria and also about tell the Austrians about Ireland, because at that time, Irish people were confused as to whether there were canals in Vienna. And, uh, <laughs> and I think a few Austrians probably thought that Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom. So it was very important at that time. And uh, yeah, student exchange, uh, but also, as you can see, uh, this connection to the Anglo-Austrian society. And, uh, yeah. Now that was my father. Uh, and you can see Austria up on the wall and in the mirror, uh, also images of Austria. So this, this was Austria's uh, outpost in in Ireland on St. Stephen's Green. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, as early as 1962, uh, the society was uh, uh, visiting Wexford for the Opera Festival. And I have a list of all the Wexford families who were only too willing to take in members because uh, I think there was only one guest house in Wexford at the time. And the other th the other piece of paper beside it is a letter from Michal Machliamor. Uh, and uh, I, I have the, if ever you want to read it, I think it's hilariously funny. Uh, this, by the way, uh, 
was our holiday home when we were kids. And uh, it has that Austrian red, white and red look about it. Uh, it was a Bauhaus and uh, the letter here beside it is an invitation to members to come down to North County Wexford uh, for a Heurige Abend. <laughs> and uh, where, where are we going now? Oh yes, so uh, Brian Boydell, does, do you remember him? He was, yes, uh, a highly respected uh, authority on um, music and uh, he uh, used to speak to the society um, and one of the uh, most um, financially rewarding activities that the society was engaged in was to bring the Vienna Boys Choir to Ireland and uh, they would perform in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral and other locations in Dublin sell out performances. They would come to Cork and they came to Limerick where John Ruddock, who was the headmaster of Villiers School, was very involved in the Limerick Music Society. And uh, it would keep the society running for uh, two years. Uh, the, uh, sale of tickets was were so good and just to <clears throat> put things in context i put this little page together from 1960 to 1970 um, you know so much happened in that decade um and it i thought it was a, an important event for 1970 that famous racehorse arkel died So members of the Irish Austrian Society could avail of all the um, functions, facilities, tours, everything that was available to members of the Anglo-Austrian Society. I don't know how my father pulled that one off, but uh, it was it was a magnificent privilege to avail of if you wanted to. And I remember going to see the Spanish Riding School in London. And it was such such a proud experience to to see. And uh, also then in the Anglo-Austrian society used to send a group over to Vienna for the ball season. Uh, my wife and I went in 1986 and I never felt so poor <laughs> going to the opera ball and seeing these ridiculously wealthy Germans uh, with bottles of Wolf Clicquot rolling around empty, rolling around on the floor, and I could barely stretch to buy a bottle of Grüner Weltliner. The prices were so ridiculously high, and I felt quite depressed uh, until I think it was the, maybe a night or two later we went to the lawyers' ball in the Hofburg. That was brilliant. Karen, my wife, she danced all night. So if ever you get a chance to get over to Vienna for the ball season. It is magnificent. So the founder of the society, my father, he died in 1987 and Dr. Otto Glaser took on that role, taking the society to new heights, a brilliant and very successful businessman. He brought new energy to the society and it didn't take too long for the links with the Anglo-Austrian society to fade as more direct contacts were established with Austria. Direct flights had some role to play in all of this. Most of you will recall the fall of communist rule in Europe, or the fall of the wall, as the Germans say. Uh, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Otto von Habsburg visit Dublin in autumn 1990. He presented his views on the new Europe to the society in a packed lecture hall in UCD. He was a MEP, a true gentleman, a scholar with a command of several European languages. And as you saw with Declan's presentation, he was the son of the last emperor, Emperor Karl. And you saw him there as a little boy with uh, Walsh or Wallace. And uh, behind every great man is a great woman and vice versa. 
Uh, Otto's wife, Pat, had been involved with the society for many, many years, and she was uh, of immense value at his side while the society changed gear. Fantastic tours to Austria were organized, as had been seen from the original ambition. But by the 1990s, travel was easier, relatively cheaper, and I, I imagine members had more disposable income. Otto could open doors to many of Austria's finest, and tales of their adventures were legendary. Even a romance blossomed on one such tour, but I'll say no more. <laughs> In the early days, uh, the German language classes were offered, but this didn't seem to last very long or go very far. I am, however, very glad to say that with Dr. Otto Glaser's initiative, a German language essay competition for secondary schools was started in the mid 1990s and thrives to this day. Like with so many successful elements of the society, the solid rock, the rock solid, sorry, rock solid management is in the hands of Mrs. Ulrike Schiller. So before the financial crash, we were powering ahead with cultural events, the most notable being the Vienna Ensemble, four musicians from the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, the lead violinist, second violin, a viola and double bass. And sometimes we paired them with Hugh Tinney performing in St. Patrick's Hall in Dublin Castle. I had the privilege to be in the background as a kind of a security. Uh, while they practiced. It was just incredible. So I mentioned earlier the Knights of Malta have been amazingly kind to us, giving us the use of their hall in Clyde Road. Initially, Noel Peart and later Peter Taff um, set all of that us, up for us. It was an ideal place to have our AGM, and many different talks on a variety of subjects. Uh, I recall uh, uh, a lecturer from Trinity, uh, giving us uh, a fantastic lecture on the difference between German and Austrian philosophy. Um, the founder, my father, had put in over 25 years leading the society. Dr. Glaser clocked up another 20 years. And when it fell to me as the first Irish born president, I looked to the RS for guidance on what might constitute a suitable term. <laughs> Much shorter. Uh, Guy Johnson took up the baton and sailed through a similar term. And now Dr. Declan Downey heads up the show and brings his vast and unique knowledge on the Irish-Austrian historical connections. I think that in one year I counted 20 events. I used to invite members to Ballymoney, that house that you saw earlier, during May. With one exception, I recall, we always enjoyed ourselves outdoors. The exception being the year we had a traditional band from Steiermark. I thought the wooden floor would collapse. Such was the great mood of that party. For many years, we've been invited to Peter Taft's beautiful house and grounds for a summer barbecue, a very special place where you feel you are transported back in time to Imperial Austria, her ancestors having been most prominent back in those days and fabulous uh, portraits hanging around her home. The commercial office of the Austrian Embassy acts as our base these days and so the close relationship endures since the foundation of the society. Over the years, the ambassador throws a great garden party each summer in the garden of the residents, and he invites members to the National Day reception at the end of October. Indeed, the most recent one seemed to have surpassed all. Every year, the society gathers before Christmas initially in the old Jewelry's Hotel off College Green, then for many years in the Royal St. George Yacht Club, 
In more recent years, Dr. Downey has organized this gala dinner in the Kildare Street and University Club. The night before last, it's an outstanding experience. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. I think I give over to uh, Gisela, as uh, I think there's been a slight change in the order of things, given that uh, Maestro uh, Thomas Sehetmeyer has uh, arrived here, and we're very, uh, very much looking forward to uh, his introduction to um, tonight's uh, concert. Um, Gisela, do you want to say a few more words, or shall I, we just I just want to welcome say that Thomas and say how how. Exactly. I, I just want to say thank I'm you. I'm delighted we are. Um, I'm really delighted about this cooperation with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. Um, Jerry, thank you very much because I think this is really a, a fantastic um, rounding of the program that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And I think it is so, we are so lucky to have the Irish Chamber Orchestra here on our campus. They are doing such fantastic work and it's really a delight to have now an Austrian uh, artistic director here, and we are very grateful for you to kind of introduce us to tonight's concert, we're, uh, concert and we're really looking forward to that. So over to you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. And very nice to meet you and very nice to welcome you to our concert tonight. Uh, I just realized I read that that's right. In 1916, October was the first meeting and the foundation of, of this uh, whole thing. So I am about one year younger than that. <laughs> so uh, tonight, and it will be actually my first concert with the Irish Chamber Orchestra, as in my position now as a chef principal. I have worked with them many times. And I was always thrilled to work with this wonderful group, really fantastic players and a lot of enthusiasm. You can reach a lot in very short time. I shouldn't promise too much. You should <laughs> listen to our concert, of course. The program is uh, two great, great, great Mozart symphonies. We hear the Prague, the famous Prague, as well as the famous G minor symphony. Uh, Mozart was already in his popularity, kind of waned in Vienna, but in Prague he was like a pop star. Uh, in 1786, 87, his opera uh, Figaro, the Nozze di Figaro, was uh, in the theatre there in Prague, in the National Theatre. And it was a huge success. People on the street would whistle the tunes from from his opera and they would just be, uh, they would welcome Mozart really like a big star. And Mozart was invited to go to Prague uh, a year later and he brought this symphony which he wrote in Vienna actually. And it's not proven that he composed that extra for this trip. But anyway, he brought that and there's not a lot of record of a performance of that. But we know that, that the first performance happened in Prague. There are some very special things about this symphony. Usually uh, he wrote uh, symphonies in four movements like he did uh, with the G minor symphony. And there is a fast movement at the beginning, then a kind of slow movement, then mostly a minuet, and then a finale fast movement. In this symphony, he he omits the, the, the menuet and many, many people have asked, have, uh, of all the mu musicologists, they have uh, searched for a reason why he did that. And they, they, they thought maybe it got lost somewhere. But I believe with many other people that the texture of this symphony is so dense. So uh, I wouldn't say, well, sophisticated, yes, but in a way, that it speaks to you. Uh, the counterpoint in the first movement on all the canonic things, the dialogues between all the voices, they are so, so fantastic and so dense. It's uh, many times uh, in other symphonies, well, 
I'm really speaking relatively. So in other symphonies, maybe there's more more singing or more 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 aria, more more uh, expression. And this is such a density of texture. You you will hear it. it it's just uh, unbelievable. The slow movement is a relatively slow movement. It's only andante, which means walking. So at that time, andante was not a real slow movement, uh, which is really. There you will have the singing exchanging with some drama as well. The finale is very busy, very, very, it's one of the few presto movements uh, Mozart wrote. And uh, it's uh, it's really busy and, and it, 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 it's a lot of talking. Anyway, it is in some ways, it is, it stands up over, over everything. Mozart wrote, if one can say that. Then we have the G minor symphony, which is part of the of a kind of set of three symphonies, uh, 39, 40, and 41. And people have suspected that this was, he just wrote these three symphonies as one big complex of work, like Nicolas Arnold Kur, uh, whom I worked with many times and whom I admire very much, he said it's even a kind of idea of an oratorio or so, since the, only the 39, number 39 has an, a slow introduction. That was also a feature of many symphonies. You will hear it, for example, in the Prague symphony that has a slow introduction and then the Allegro movement. So uh, the G, G minor symphony is in the middle of that, and the argument is, OK, this symphony does have a slow introduction. And the finale is not as spectacular as you would expect a really triumphant, triumphant uh, end of a big symphony. So and still. Nowadays, people are very sure that Mozart used it for a certain performance, since there are two versions of this G minor symphony. We have uh, a set of winds, we have uh, two horns, we have two flutes, uh, two oboes, we have one flute, two oboes, uh, two clarinets, two bassoons, and uh, in, in the G minor symphony. And the first version is without clarinets. So Mozart later added the clarinets, which he loved. He, he, he adored the clarinet as a music instrument. He wrote this famous the clarinet concerto and clarinet quintet for Anton Stadler. And he adored the clarinet. And this gives hint that he changed this symphony for a certain set of musicians uh, who, who, whom he had. So uh, if you uh, compose a symphony, just flute, oboes, bassoons, and horns, and then you add clarinets, then it must be for practical reason, people think now, as, as I do too. So he must have had a performance in mind uh, where he had clarinets and he didn't want to miss this beautiful color. So we will present the version with clarinets. In between, there is uh, quite a significant piece. Who of you knows music by Karl Amadeus Hartmann? It's here, uh, it's in Germany, it's more performed than in the English speaking countries. In Germany, Hartmann was, is now in a hero because he, uh, this concerto, which you will hear, is a strong protest against the Second World War. And we even didn't have this in mind, Jerry and I, when we programmed it, but it unfortunately it becomes very actual now. And uh, Hartmann wrote a few years before the piece Midere. Uh, which is which he dedicated to his murdered friends in Dachau. During the Nazi period, he forbid his music to be played. So he was he stayed in Germany. He remained in Germany, uh, being in Germany, but he forbid his music to be played in Germany. And he had a strong uh, somebody who helped him very much. The great conductor. Are you okay? Do you need some water? <laughs> All right. No, no, no. Don't worry. 
uh, the great conductor Hermann Scherchen, who premiered many, many pieces also by Webern, uh, Schoenberg and Baird. He was really helping Karl Amadeus Hartmann. He performed his pieces outside of Germany. And Hartmann was actually politically, he was on the socialist, the communist side. And after the war, uh, the East Germany tried to get him uh, to, to get him for their system. But Hartmann was so much fed up with kind of totalitarian systems that he wanted to, of course, he wanted to be independent. When after the war, he founded the serious Musica Viva in, in Munich. And, you know, people, he, he never made a fuss of, of himself. He didn't advertise. Uh, himself in his series of music, he let all others play, all other uh, contemporary uh, composers. So it was not that he was never making, he was not a good businessman, if, if we, we would say. And therefore, his, I think, therefore, his music is still uh, not well enough known. The piece itself uh, consists of four movements. I thought I'd play it just because you will have the chance to listen. The first movement starts actually with a, a little orchestra and then uh, the violin plays. This is the first of three phrases, and it's uh, Hartmann uses an old Hussite choral for as as an idea for this first movement. The next movement you can hear a lot of marche funebre. Uh, you will hear steps in the orchestra together with a with a passionate melody, a quiet and passionate melody in in the in the solo violin. The th it was written 1939, so at the beginning of the Second World War, and the third movement is just a horror scenario of the war. It starts like this. And this theme goes through all voices and uh, the whole orchestra plays it. And it is a kind of very dramatic scenario with the Yeah, you, 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 will, you will see it is uh, just describing the war with, with all his pain and with all its pain and, and, and its horrors. The end, the last movement, is actually an, another march, funebre. And you, I don't know, uh, I play you the melody, which is also a well-known melody. <laughs> And Hermann Scherchen, the great conductor whom I mentioned before, brought that melody from Russia. And it is an old uh, uh, song of the revolution, uh, singing about the victims uh, uh, of the revolution, and it's it's uh, memorizing the victims of the revolution, and so that's what I told the orchestra. And Joachim, our first viola player, said, who, who who grew up in East Germany, he said, "Oh yes, we sang it in school." So uh, so I had the German text "Unsterbliche Opfer," and I, I showed it to him. Oh yes, exactly, that was the song. So uh, and then. It doesn't end happy. It ends with a cluster, which which is quite dramatic. Uh, so I think I, I don't know. If, I think for the orchestra, it was the first time that we programmed that piece. I have played this piece uh, for 40 years. 
many times and I always I have had uh, comments that oh, it was really people people would shiver and and well I don't want to <laughs> take away your feelings of course and uh, I don't know how long I am supposed to speak but I have to go anyway soon to the <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> I don't want to miss the rehearsal. Anyway, but what I want to say is it's a, an enormous pleasure for me to be here and uh, contributing to the Austrian Irish <laughs> working together. This is fantastic and very nice to meet you and very, very welcome to our concert tonight. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so very, very much. That was so wonderful to hear and to hear your playing. It's just, we're so fortunate and so privileged to have the uh, Irish team. Well, to be here. <laughs> it's wonderful. It, we're so privileged also to see Jerry here, to have the Irish Chamber Orchestra here uh, at the University of Limerick. I, for one, I wouldn't be here without the Irish Chamber Orchestra being here in Limerick. And it's wonderful to see them going from strength to strength was this magnificent, magnificent uh, concert. Uh, last week and to have the concert tonight and it was so wonderful, wonderful to hear this this introduction. Uh, so looking forward to the Mozart, but also so especially looking forward to the to the Hartmann piece. And thank you so much for uh, explaining to us about that. It's, it's it's really wonderful. Thank you very very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that brings us then to, to a very uh, fitting end to our uh, session on uh, Irish-Austrian <laughs> connections uh, in history uh, up to the present day uh, with someone we're also incredibly uh, privileged and fortunate to have here uh, amongst us and to have here in uh, Austria for the second time round, I think that is quite unique to have uh, the pleasure of such a marvelous uh, ambassador, not just once, but a uh, second time round. I don't think uh, His Excellency Dr. Thomas Nader needs any further introduction. Uh, so we're very, very grateful for you being here and for all your magnificent support in so many ways over over the years. The floor how, is all how yours. Much do I, how much time do I have? I'm looking at Gisela. <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten okay. Well, thank you. I, I had prepared a compendium, but okay, I can. Yeah. Um, just, just to, I mean, I think it's fitting that I would speak after after Mr. Thiert, my, my uh, coming from Vienna, the, the town where Mozart lived and worked. And uh, you might know that his relationship with money was not the best. When he had money, he would rent a big house, and then he would throw the money out. He would be thrown out as well. So when you go through the inner parts of Vienna, you find lots of houses with a small plaquette saying Mozart lived here from this month of the year to this week of this year. But there's one, one outstanding house with a plaquette saying, we can guarantee with absolute certainty that Mozart never lived in this house. <laughs> so, to the Austrian-Irish relations, I, I don't want to cover the, the ground that has been covered already so, so aptly. And, but I want to say a few things uh, on the history. One is that we are who we are as Europeans. We are who we are with our roots in Christianity, Jewish religion, in Roman Greek history, because of the Irish monks in two waves, Christianizing, starting with England and Wales. I don't know why the Irish started with England and Wales, but they did. And coming on in two waves uh, to Austria. The second important point for me is, uh, I think it's very difficult nowadays to imagine what it meant 11th century with a population which was virtually illiterate. We shouldn't think the Schottenstifter, the convents, only as place of religion. They were the first place of modern administration. When 
the ruler asked the Benedictines to form the Schottenstift in Wien. He was not he was not only interested in religion. He needed an administrative center in in my hometown. So the modern administration is also impacted by the Irish. And when people complain about it, I would say, look, look at Austria. We had we had 900 years to really mess it up. <laughs> but I think we we should we should make this point, this important contribution of Irish to modern administration and to, to Christianity and to our roots. The, the other point was made that uh, Ireland's biggest export article over the centuries was military men fighting very often on both sides of conflict. Uh, the, the one event I want to add is 1789. It is the French Revolution. With the French Revolution, we always applaud the, the three beautiful daughters, Liberté, Fraternity, Egalité. We never mentioned the big brother that has been shaping the world ever since, nationality, nationalism, the birth of nation states. Why do I mention that? Because I guess for Ireland, this concept must have been a boost. Irish had people, they had the country, which at that time was governed by someone else, but you had the ingredients. For the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, it meant the opposite. The monarchy was the construct which was based on multi-ethnic origins. And it's very interesting to see, we had the French Revolution in 1789. We had the last point of glory in 1814-15 with the Congress in Vienna. And from that point onwards, you see the rise of Germany, which is based on the concept of nationality. And complementary, you see the decline of the monarchy, which ended in 1918. With 1918, the order we knew in Austria ended. And uh, <clears throat> at the peace, treaty in France when the French were asked, well, if you give everything to the Czechs, to the Hungarians, what's Austria? He said, well, Austria is the rest. And uh, one university teacher once described it to me. He said, well, the new Austria was basically the old capital and the areas where the aristocracy would go for summer holidays. We had no raw material industry was elsewhere. And the winter of, of 1918 was dreadful because coal exports had stopped from Czechoslovakia because there were such emotions. And again, if I, if I compare it with Ireland, you got your independence shortly afterwards. And I guess most Irish at that time were proud Irish. Most Austrians, didn't believe that Austria could exist at that time. An American millionaire, he even got calculations how much he would have to pay to buy the whole lot off because it was just a bankruptcy. We had referenda in the Western part wanting to join Germany. Why? Because an American president, Mr. Wilson, had decreed his 14 point. And one point was on self-determination. So the Austrians said, well, why not joining? Why not joining Germany? Self-determination, and it's it's interesting that the Americans never signed the peace treaties in 1918 because they said it's unfair. Now, why was Austria denied? Austria was denied because had we joined Germany, the only country bigger after the First World War would have been the loser of the war, Germany. That was unacceptable to the French and the Brits. They could not accept that. They had fought four years of war so that Germany at the end would be bigger than before. So I would say from the point of Austria, the, the low point was the, the shock of having losing the monarchy, but also not knowing what to do with this small entity. And the result, but for different reasons, the result was civil war in Austria, and there was also civil war in Ireland. 
before the First World War, there could not be diplomatic relations between Ireland and, and the monarchy simply because Ireland didn't exist. So whatever there was, was conducted between the courts in, in London and, and Vienna. And, and uh, one small anecdote, you might know that um, Empress Sissi, the wife of Francis Joseph, was various occasions in Ireland. And there is the folklore about her riding and riding accents. What is never mentioned is the fact that she came here without a courtesy visit to the London court, which was a pretty big snub to the to the royals. Don't forget they were related. So sometimes I think the real predecessor of Princess Di was prob probably <laughs> Empress Elizabeth. So before the war, it couldn't be. Between the wars, frankly speaking, both countries had different problems than starting diplomatic relations with a small entity far, far away. So there were no really contacts. We, we come to the Second World War. The Second World War had, for me as Austrian, for the Austrians, a few very big consequences. One is that the idea to join Germany was dead. After the experience of the war, no Austrians wanted to join Germany. That, that was completely dead. Secondly, the warring fractions of the civil war in Austria had been interned together in the same concentration camps by the Nazis. I met once a, an, an elderly English. He was in the English secret service between the wars. And he said, every time I visited Austria, another group was in concentration camps. First, the conservatives had in turn the social democrats and then the Nazis, and then the conservatives had in turn the Nazis and then the Nazis had in turn the other two groups. So being together in the concentration camps, they found out that the other side was actually quite decent people. And the trauma of the Second World War led to cooperation to a point when young people are probably frustrated that everything in Austria is consensus and talked and talked and talked to death. And we had this consensus culture until a new generation of politicians that had not experienced the Second World War came, came up. It, it came to the point we don't have strikes. We have strike seconds. We have the trade unions in the legal process, etc. So it's a very consensus policy, which has its rules in the experience of the Second World War. And the third point, which is important, is our neutrality. So we woke up after the war knowing we are definitely not Germans. But how do you create a national identity? We, we had identities, don't get me wrong. And to date, if you ask someone, you can ask Natasha, she would say the county she comes from. I'm Tyrolean, I'm Corinthian. No Austrian will tell you I'm Austrian in the first place. So our identity is there. But how to create an Austrian identity? And it was created around neutrality, which means it's now part of our identity, devoid of its meaning. If you would ask in a refer referendum, would you want to remain neutral and join NATO, people would say yes and wouldn't see that this is a contradiction. So there is no way of Austria joining NATO because Russia invaded Ukraine. I I'm on, I'm sometimes ask, well, you Austrians, you have the Germans, we Irish, we have the Brits, is that the same? My answer is yes and no. Because Ireland was always having to deal with a bigger neighbor. If you look at our history, most of our history, we were on an equal footing. It's only since 1918 that we have a big neighbor. So it's, we cannot really compare the Irish-Austrian relation to the English-Irish relations. Now, just a few points where we are now. Austria and Ireland today are very similar in size. We have lots in common. Both are small countries, democracies based on the rule of law. We have open economies. We are depending on free trade. We have lots of areas we think alike, from gender to the non-use of, of nuclear power, questions of international rule of law. 
and we are both in the European Union, but not in NATO. This is important because what we see now, not only because of the dreadful Russian aggression, but if you go before that, the discussion in Europe over the last 300 years was a discussion between the French dominance or the British dominance. As long as the Brits were in the European Union, there would not be a movement to European security outside NATO. Something the French always favored. Now the Brits have left, the French are still there. And there's the threat from Russia. We're going to see a much more assertive demand for a European security within the European Union. And there, Ireland and Austria, I think would be natural allies to at least coordinate their positions and to see how we can formulate a system in which we can live and keeping our neutral status, because we think that's an added value to, to have. So we have a lot in common. We have one area where it will get, I think, more intense in the, in the future. We have the same similar views on, on the big crisis uh, uh, climate change. The point where we go different paths maybe is based on, on, that's why I have the map here, is based on geography. Ireland is in the western part of Western Europe. We are in the middle of Central Europe. The big challenge about from climate is migration. Ireland so far has accustomed roughly 62,000 Ukrainians who want to stay. They get temporary protection. That's a lot for a country of five million. This is, uh, I can only applaud the Irish for that. We are a little bit below that. We have 85,000 who stay in Austria with 9 million people. But the 85,000 we have is only 20% of the Ukrainians arriving in Austria. 80% travel on. But also those traveling on need to be fed, transported, administered, cared for. In addition, Ireland saw a raise in internal in, in uh, international applicants for international protection. In the first half, 6,500 people asked for that. That is refugees other than Ukrainians. We had in the first nine months, 99,000 applicants other than Ukrainians who want to stay in Austria, which explains sometimes that there are different views on migration. And as I said, it is based on geography. With that short overview, and hoping not to have exceeded my time, I say thank you for your attention. And thanks for having had this wonderful afternoon. Thank you. So I think, um, thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, and thank you very much to our chair who kept everything wonderfully together. And we are, we are slightly over um, our time, but never mind. We now have a treat in store, a further treat in store, because this was a really, I thought it was a fascinating session, and I'm really very grateful to you all. Um, we are now going down to the special collections and have a very brief tour. Now, our, I'm not totally sure whether how far we're going, but we're first going to the special collection because we are awaited there um, by the director of the special collection, Ken Garman. So um, please take everything with you because we won't come back here again. And thanks again to our wonderful speakers. Yes, yeah, but we have the same. Yeah. No, we have the same because we are surrounded in NATO countries. <laughs>